Hey everyone, welcome to Two Car Pros. My name is Ryan and today we're going to be looking at what to do if your OBD2 port isn't working. Now obviously with any repair there can be a lot of different answers to one question, but this video is going to encompass pretty much the most common one that is basically 99% of all OBD2 port uh, malfunctions or just plain not working. So I had a buddy bring me this car, it's an 05 uh, Honda Civic Hybrid, and uh, the door locks don't work anymore, the head unit doesn't work, the radio doesn't work, um, and it's throwing up all kinds of trouble codes on the dash, which all is pretty much related with how this uh, Honda is wired. And when I went to go plug in the OBD2 port, well, it's not working. And I thought this would be an excellent video to make uh, to show what do you do next. So with all that out of the way, let's jump into it. So Buddy brought in this car, and you'll notice that it has a check engine light on. We're currently in park, but the D light is flashing for some reason. We have a maintenance light up here and an IMA light, the integrated motor assist light on. So. What can we do next is move on to plugging our scanner in. So we had the ignition at the second position like you normally would when you're going to scan a vehicle. What we can do is check out, I've already had my basic scanner plugged in, and look, it doesn't turn on. What's going on? Well, unfortunately our OBD2 port is not getting power, which is super interesting. And the reason I'm using a really basic scanner is because this actually feeds off of the car's electricity and doesn't have its own battery like my fancy pants scanner you'll see later does. That actually has its own, own internal battery, so it's a little tricky to see uh, whether or not it's getting power or not, but this is definitely not getting power, so. so something's wrong and we need to figure it out. The first thing we should do is confirm that that port does not have power coming out of it. So before we go testing, uh, attach your test light to a ground. There's many grounds all over the underside of this dash, and I'm just gonna test it on a fuse I know should be lit, and you can see the test light functions. So that removes that as a variable, and now we can test our port. What we can do now, we still have the key in the second position, like we're gonna be plugging a scanner into it, and we can check port number 16. That should have power for our tester at all times, which is this guy in the top left. And you can see my test light is not lighting up, which means that is getting no power. So now we can move on to the fuse. Just to make sure, we'll test the light again. The light is still good. So we 100% know that port number 16 right there doesn't work, so now we're gonna need to go look at the fuse. So here is our fuse box. It's in front of our driver's side shock tower. We can go ahead and pinch these tabs and remove the plastic protector. So the fuse we're looking for today is number nine. That controls our audio unit, DLC, car link interface, gauge assembly, immobilizer control unit, keyless receiver unit, and uh, MCM, which are all not functioning on this vehicle as of right this moment. So we can see from this diagram, it's also on the back of our box, and check it out. Number nine is right there. It's this 10 fuse right here. We can just remove that and take a look at it. There you go. Pretty as a picture, that is a blown fuse, but we can double check it by using our little fuse tester. Put these two prongs on here, and if it makes connection, this green light will light up. That's a no good. So this fuse is blown, it's junk, throw it in the trash. I just got my brand new 10 amp fuse here. Can touch our tester to it, see that's what it should look like if the fuse is good. That little green light lights up. And I can see just from a vis visual inspection that the connection is not interrupted. So let's put this in and see what happens. Well, something's beeping, so that's a good sign. Now we can go plug in our scanner again to see if it works. And check that out, our scanner is now working. We can actually ask it to read the codes and see what it comes up with. So it has three codes, P1600, P700, and 1600. Okay, that's all good and well, but I'm not really sure what that means without Googling it, because I don't have all the trouble codes memorized, but what I can do is go get my fancy pants scanner and that'll give us a little more information. I was just using this to make sure that we have power. So now I have my fancy scanner plugged into our OBD2 port with the key in the second position in the ignition, like how you'd normally scan a vehicle. And we're gonna go ahead and look for our VIN number so we can get to scanning. And that's our VIN number, so I'm gonna push OK. And you could do this with a basic scanner as well, but this one's uh, much more visually pleasing. Select our region. 
That's what the car is. We're going to click auto scan because we want to scan all the systems that the vehicle has to offer. We're basically doing a CAN scan right now. I want to see every single code this car has and see if it is attributed to that fuse being popped. So this is going to scan the CAN, it's going to scan the hybrid system, it's going to scan literally everything. And that little fuse right there um, can throw codes like that. So let's go ahead and uh, see if it comes up that way. All right, our scanner just finished scanning all of the CAN, all the systems on this car. And the only ones it came up with are four faults on the engine here. So we have an IMA system malfunction, a uh, AT system malfunction, AC signal high output, and a system malfunction on the IMA again. So all of these codes basically can be caused by that fuse going out. And a great way that we can double check this is we can go back and erase those codes. So we're going to erase those codes. Basically, we're going to clean all the codes off of the ECM-PCM and get those check engine lights off. Now, if I'm right and that blown fuse, uh, you know, threw uh, some weird codes in there and made that check engine light come on and we drive the car around for a while until the monitors reset, that check engine light won't come back. But if I'm wrong and those check engine lights are uh, valid and it's some other problem, that check engine light's going to come back on anyway. So it's a great way to go ahead and check. It's rechecking again, but it probably won't see anything uh, again if something else is wrong. You're going to have to drive it around for about 50 miles or so until those monitors inside of the computer reset. I'm turn the ignition switch off. Turn the ignition switch back on. And then we're going to read those codes again. No codes. Very cool. Escape back. It's going to read those codes again for the uh, engine there. And we have no more codes listed on our fancy pants scanner. So now what we can do is go take the car for a drive. There's our current mileage, 112,346. I'm going to go ahead and drive home and back. That should be about 60 to 70 miles, more than enough time for the monitors to reset. As you can see, all our check engine lights are gone, the maintenance required lights on, but that's basically a reminder for your oil change. So there's like a little secret handshake you have to do to get that off. We'll go over that in a subsequent video. I just want to get those, uh, that IMA light off and the check engine light off. And what's encouraging as well as the head heat unit turned on when we replaced that fuse. And you might recall the head unit power goes through that fuse as well. So it is nice and encouraging that that turns back on. All right, made it back the next day, and you can see that our mileage has gone up significantly. Uh, more than enough time for those monitors to reset, and our check engine light is nowhere to be found, neither is that IMA light. So this was a nice, cheap, and easy fix. That's always nice. So that little fuse, that one fuse being popped and not connected can throw all of those codes. It can cause all kinds of weird little electronic anomalies in your vehicle. I know that seems a little far-fetched that I replaced one fuse and I got rid of all these trouble codes and a bunch of things came back to life, but it is the honest to God truth. That can happen in modern automobiles where, you know, one fuse goes bad and the whole dash lights up with all kinds of pretty lights and it's, you know, says a bunch of different codes, but it's not actually the truth. You need to replace that fuse and then drive the car for about 50 miles and uh, maybe even up to 100. It depends on uh, different makes and models. 50 is usually what I, I say for the you know less fancier cars, but the more fancier cars, you know, higher end BMWs, Mercedes, that kind of a thing, uh, seem to their monitors seem to be a little bit higher. They seem to be right around like the 100 mile mark. So uh, that's something to consider as well. And when you reset those codes, uh, if it does have a problem, you know, a real problem, not just a fuse, uh, those codes would come back anyway, so don't be afraid of er erasing those. That's basically how you fix your OBD2 port not working. Now, uh, I want to make this video kind of general, so it covers uh, lots of different makes and models. Uh, different makes and models can route where their OBD2 port gets power from in different fuses, and you need to find that information out. And where can you head to find that information? At our website, twocarpros.com. You can ask a question and get a answer from an expert uh, within a few hours, and it is always free. Just sign up and ask your question. You know, hey, my OBD2 port's not working. Which fuse do I check? That'd be a great template for you to find out that information because sometimes they route it just through the radio fuse and sometimes it's not listed. So having that back information is a good idea. And you might be wondering, 
why does the OBD2 port have uh, a fuse that's combined with a bunch of different things? Well, if they didn't do that, your fuse panel would be enormous. It'd be the size of a piano. So they basically route a bunch of different uh, little auxiliary electrics through one uh, 10 amp fuse instead of having, you know, 50 or so one amp fuses. That's basically how that works in your car. Thank you so very much for watching. Make sure you're subscribed and I'll see you next time.